Perfect. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, it's Bruce Calder here. I'm the VP of Operations and Consulting Services here at Claygen. We have a very, very full webinar. It's going to go a little extra long. I apologize. It's um, there's a lot of content. So, in, in some of this content, it, there's so much content here actually um, that some of it's going to I'm going to go through extra brief. You're going to have all the slides as reference. Everybody who has registered. Um, we'll receive a copy of the slides. I'm going to turn my webcam because I'm a bit of a hands talker. So make good. Oh, by the way, so there, there's a tremendous amount of content here. Um, and I just gave everybody a little extra time to join. We have hundreds and hundreds of registrants today. So uh, that's uh, very flattering. It's awesome. So I'm going to try to give you a lot of good content. So there's so much content in here. Some parts will be brief and you can go back and review it. So a lot of it's for reference. There's a lot of uh, detail here. So I'm gonna talk a tiny bit about the PFAS legislation because when I talk about where the PFAS is, are perfluoroalkyl substances, applied primarily uh, floral polymers, but I will talk about the floral salts like PFOA, are in products. Um, there's a lot, a tremendous amount of detail, but the legislations and what's restricted, what isn't, is to put a lot in context. And I talk a lot about our testing process, which I strongly recommend, and I'll show you why. It's a very, very effective way of getting a very, very good answers in a timely manner. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the, the overall testing results, looking at um, data in summary, what we're seeing for results. And then we're gonna break down every major type of PFAS component we find in complex articles. So we're talking physical products like chairs or computers or laboratory equipment or medical devices, uh, complicated devices. Um, but it also includes uh, clothing and a whole pile of things, complicated products, things generally with at least 20 parts or more. So in, in talking physical products, I'm not talking liquids and powder chemicals or refrigerants, I'm talking physical products. And this is all based on what there is. This isn't theoretically what's around, this is, is what's there, what we're finding in products. So this is, you know, most, it's funny, if you, if you look at a lot of the different, you know, restriction proposals in one jurisdiction or another, there's so much that's copy pasted from each other and there's a real lack of real data. So that's where a lot of this is. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end. This one's going to go a little extra long, I believe. So now with uh, no more ado. So meanwhile, at the same time, separate of this, we're working on the Clegan EU PFAS restriction project. I strongly recommend it. It's phenomenal. It is basically it's an EU consultation till September 25th. We're submitting and on the behalf of dozens of companies, um, and, but we're doing most of the work. Uh, they're doing wonderful contributions, making sure their uses are. So if you wanna make sure your uses have derogations or exemptions, definitely join the project, but you wanna see what else is going on, you will learn more in this project on PFAS than anywhere else. It's not even close. Um, so we're working on four technical submissions, which I'll explain and then one submission of all the derogations needed. And there's over 50 different derogations needed and we're not exaggerating or, or you know, being, you know, trying to get things derogated or exempted that don't really make sense. There's a tremendous reason they're needed. Um, the for, the fourth, technical, uh, fourth technical submission actually goes into the substitutes and you can see once you've done the substitute options and the pros and cons, everything else makes a lot more sense. So this is easily the most informative and most useful project on PFAS. So today I'm mostly gonna talk about testing, but I definitely have to talk about our PFAS uh, restriction project. It's one cost per company. It's phenomenal. You learn more than you can possibly imagine, and you can be have much more assurance on what path your uses are taking, whether they're gonna be banned or when, et cetera. Um, there's five submissions. One is based on a lot of what we're talking about today. One's going to be PFAS and articles, and the US EPA has reached out. They want this data too. There is a complete lack of tangible data other than what people have told them, and it's kind of neat. When I look at the previous consultations, it's such a mismatch of whoever told them things as opposed to what's really there. And many times when a company said, hey, I use it for this, it's a really refined view on their application, not actually why that material is used. That material is used because of a property it has, that property might be useful in their application, but there are many other applications where that property is also needed, whether it's temperature, acid resistance, or flexibility, or low friction, et cetera. Um, then we're gonna have to do a submission of where PFOA really is, which is not the same where the PFAS is. So the dangerous one, the one they find in drinking water and bloodstream, that family is not all in all PFAS. It's only in some, and there's a reason why it's there in some cases. In some cases, that material you can't get around, but often it's a very specific use. Um, there are tons and tons of news articles, which was galvanizing uh, the different jurisdictions and their science papers behind it. This is actually summarizing the science papers in a very brief manner and saying, you know what? 
they're not, it's not PFAS in the drinking water or blood. It's the PFOA and PFOS family. And this is where they're from. So if you want to regulate it, this is what you need to regulate. And in many cases, enforce the, the rules you already have and you make a huge difference. The fact you're not enforcing your own rules is half the problem. Um, and then a very, very technical one. This is quite a large one, even though it's, it's in brief. It's probably one of the uh, simplest reads. It's a comparison of all the different materials. We're not really doing the comparison of PFOA versus everything else. We're doing Teflon and Viton and CalRes, which are the brand names, you know, uh, floral, floral elastomers, and then against peak and stainless steel and silicone and polyurethane and what the pros and cons. And once you've done the pros and cons and the alternatives, a lot of the uses are pretty self-evident why you need PTFE, et cetera. And then the derogation is needed, which is there'll be there's over 50 of them. And they're not, and there are, a lot of them are quite general actually. So we have to be specific to justify why they get approved, but a lot of them are actually quite specific. It's amazing what it's used for. And once you do the comparison of alternatives, you can see why. Um, one of the things people pick on a lot of times they say, hey, look, my we're, you know, any news article, they blame fry pans with PTFE for the PFOA in the drinking water. A couple of things. A uh, the PTFE in, in fry pans has no PFOA. There's an, no reason for it to be there. And it doesn't have a structure that degrades into it. So you're wrong. You went the wrong way. Second, that fry pan uh, has one instance of PFAS. One. Your average electronics has 20 instances of PFAS. This whole thing is far more impactful on electronics, even more so than your average medical device, believe it or not, um, than it is in any of the food. Um, so this submission project is fantastic. It's moving along. It's on schedule. We don't have a choice. We have to be on schedule because it has to be submitted by September 25th. Uh, the participants, I think even non-participants will see a copy of it, but you can't join unless you're a participant. We're actually going over all the draft technical submissions uh, a week today. They're mostly done. They should all be done by then. So we'll go over the drafts and they'll be circulated around and everybody gets to go through them. Very, very strongly recommended. Uh, tremendous wealth of information. and. Whatever goes into this will likely change the world. It, 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 you know, it sounds a bit grandiose, but literally they need technical data and this will have a lot of technical data. As we saw, so as of today, the bisphenol restriction for each just got withdrawn. And it's withdrawn partially because of a submission we did. Because here's actually where BPA is. And they're like, oh, we can't do this restriction right now unless we take it out all into account. Otherwise, we can't have vacuum cleaners anymore or anything like that. So um, we re, it, it's that powerful. So you, if you look at the bisphenol A, you look it up today, the restriction got withdrawn today to be resubmitted because of use information that was provided. And that's the same sort of thing that's gonna happen here. So this is a very, very big deal. Um, even a little thing, even a small little one we helped put together for bisphenol um, pulled, the, pulled the entire restriction. So, Big, big deal. Um, there's the technical data, not that I need something, I need something, I need something. It doesn't matter that much. You really have to get the technical data. This is gonna be phenomenal. So strongly recommend, if you're not part of it all uh, already, you're missing out, truth be told. Now, why are we doing a lot of this? So first today, when I'm gonna talk about where PFAS is, the floral salts, which is what's fine in drinking water and such, they're the ones that are restricted right now, but only the long versions. So the perfluorocarboxylates, big long word, the PFOA family is banned right now. Um, oh, great question. Somebody asked if it's to be recorded today. Yes, everything's gonna be recorded. Uh, thank goodness, because this is gonna be a lot. Um, everybody will receive a recording. Um, depends which one's more entertaining, whether it's the morning one or the afternoon one. Um, so this restrictions right now around PFOA or longer. And pop bands PFOA in Europe and, and reach bands, the longer versions. And they're all bioaccumulants. And what it really means is their half life, the length they live without falling apart, and the environment is quite long. Um, and the reason is uh, very simply the carbon fluorine bond has got a very high energy of bond association. You're like, I didn't come here for chemistry. Well, you're going to get chemistry. Um, it means it's really hard to break the carbon fluorine bond. So it stays around forever. It's one of its actual great properties of the whole thing. It doesn't react with much either because it's the carbon fluorine bond that doesn't degrade. Um, and that's why it sticks around. So they're bioaccumulants and they're banned. Uh, invasive implantable devices have been a little bit longer, have till July of 2025. And if they don't change that, like our submission project, 
about 20 to 40 percent of all medical devices, invasive or implantable, are no longer allowed on the market because it's so, the PFOA is so plentiful in their uses. So that's restricted today. So I am going to mention that in every single situation with the risk of this being there. If you're not testing for it, well, hopefully the, there's no enforcement because you're in trouble. Um, everybody gets paid attention to the U.S. side because Maine was originally creating a reporting requirement and they delayed theirs. Now Minnesota's got theirs in, in the same time as Maine, more or less, when we have to report for PFAS. They're not different legislation. They're all one. And if you're part of our quarterly or monthly updates, we'd explain it all. But it's basically a model legislation that the state's Northeast Waste Management Official Association put together, which includes well, California and Washington State somehow. Not really that Eastern, but there we are. Um, and they put together model legislation in each of these states, like 15 states are implementing it. However, by the time it gets through their legislation, it may or may not look like what it started, but they're actually all the same thing. They just don't necessarily come out of their legislation the same way. They're all going to eventually have reporting likely through the same uh, web portal called the Interstate Chemical Clearinghouse. This is reporting. So it's not a restriction. It's reporting. The Canadian reporting requirement will likely kick in at the same time as with the U.S. federal. Strangely enough, they'll all be roughly the same time. Um, but this is, of course, the biggest one. It's the EU PFAS uh, ban that was proposed in February. Um, there's a consultation going on until September 25th, and that's the key one. Any derogations or uses you have for PFAS have to really be submitted by September 25th to keep them. Then there's a, it's a deadline. So uh, for derogations, exemptions. So then there'll be comments, probably they're being published in parallel, but some, there'll be a whole bunch at the end. So it's gonna take them a little bit of time to publish all of them. Um, there's gonna be a, sec a review in parallel uh, technical review, which you use any technical information in particular from the consultation, they're desperate for technical information, as is the FDA, as is Environment Canada in Canada. Um, there will eventually be draft text, probably second half of 2024, probably if they don't withdraw the, withdraw the restriction to rejigger it, um, because they're going to need 50 to 60 derogations, exemptions, which is going to be a lot. Um, the earliest we'll see probably leg final legislation, probably middle 2025. There's another consultation they have to do, which is a go-no-go -no -go type led, uh, consultation. We publish probably end of 2025, if nothing else happens. And the first restrictions are about August 2027. So really, we have to submit stuff by September 20, September 25th this year, so your products don't get restricted August 2027. And if, if you're a medical device right now, your PFOA um, exemption going in 2025 will kibosh lots of your products. And I'll show you why, unless you can extend it. So really we're talking about testing here. Um, we have a very, very comprehensive, best in the world for sure. We do a lot of interlab, it's not even close. Um, we use wavelength dispersive XRF for fluorine content. So no fluorine, no PFAS. If it's intentionally there, it's over 50 ppm. It's really generally over 100 ppm, but if it's there on purpose, over 50 ppm. You're like, well, PFA, PFOA is banned at 25 parts per billion. Yes, but it's never there because it's supposed to be there. It's there because there's another fluoro there and it comes, it's, a, at this point in time, a degradation product only. PFOA, by the way, is not added to any products. Neither is the precursor, the, you know, the Zonal family, um, the C8 family, is not added to anything, actually. It is completely deg deg degradation only. It's a fall apart for very particular reasons of very specific materials. Um, so PFOA isn't there unless there's a fluoro there on purpose. It's the way it is. All intentional fluoros are there over 50 ppm. Anything that's Unintentional, like down in parts per billion, is there inside an intentionally added PFAS. So use the the XRF to identify it. The wavelength dispersive, you can't use an energy dispersive. It's like your handheld, it's not powerful enough, and air will block the signal from fluorine because fluorine is too high up the periodic table. You need a vacuum environment with a whole bunch of power, like the wavelength dispersive XRF machines we have. Um, and then we also use FTIR, and FTIR won't find 50 ppm of fluorine. What it will tell you what material it is, and that helps us tell us why it's there. And since the, all these restrictions can be so derogation-based, exemption-based in uses and applications, we need to know what material it is. So we need to know why it's there. Not just that it is there, we know why, because otherwise we can't use the exemptions. I mean, it's kind of funny, yeah, we found uh, you know, th 30 PFAS instances in your product. Good luck with that. What we do is here's the 30, and this is why they're there. there. And as, as exemptions get created, we can apply the exemptions to them. You also know for something like this, what your uses really are, not just that they're there, but why they're there. That's really important for reporting, but it's a big deal for restrictions. Um, so I'm gonna focus mostly on this uh, section, WBXRF, uh, oversimplified. Um, 
they're non-polymer PFAS, they're salts, they're not generally there on purpose. If they are on purpose there, like PFBS can be, because it can clear flame retarded polycarbonate, make it more transparent, uh, it'll still be over 50 ppm. Um, almost all the time when it's there, or supposed to be there, it's because somebody added a floral polymer. So intentionally there, 1% of the time. There are these ones, 99% of the time it's this one. And they're, they're adding polymers. There's a handful of non-polymer intentional uses. Uh, PFBS is one of them, uh, potentially surfactant in the backside in adhesives, in silicone-based adhesives is another intentional use. Um, so big time, so WDUXRF, it finds all the intentional uses. Because if a non-polymer is added like PFBS, it's still well over uh, 50 parts per million. When PFOA is there in the parts per billion, it's inside another floral. Very simplified, no fluorine, no PFAS. The F is fluorine. So there's, there's two measure, ways to measure fluorine. We use combustion uh, ion chromatography for very specific reasons, but normally we cannot because it doesn't work. Um, we have to use the WDX ref. We've done a lot of interlab with ion chromatography. Uh, it can't pick up PFAS and surface coatings on plastic properly, and that's a problem. So for example, um, one of the most common PFAS, the fluoro spray, it's an aerosol. We took three random parts. Um, and we sprayed them with a uh, very common, one of the most common uh, PFASs. It's a fluoro spray. Uh, it's either fluoro silicone or this one's a dry one, so it's just dry PTFE. Um, we sprayed it up to, and XRF sees it real easily. And um, combustion bomb doesn't see it till it's over 100,000 ppm, I mean, not 100,000, 10,000 ppm, which kind of a little higher than the 50 ppm reporting limits and such. So, and we did the same thing with coffee cups, same thing with food, it just can't see it until it's about 10,000 ppm surface concentration. It just, what happens is combustion ion chromatography incinerates the part and then measures any fluorine left over. And of course, it's only in the surface, it can't see it. And surface is a big deal for the EU and the US because that's the one they're worried about. Almost everything they're restricting in the US is all surface related um, surfaces, everything we just can't use ion chromatography. We do use it for two situations uh, where it's not safe to test, uh, lithium batteries, they use PVDF and PTFE, but mostly PVDF as the binder in the cathode inside. Uh, we can't really dismantle lithium batteries very safely. It's exothermic. It's the nicest way to push it. So, but we can incinerate it. If it's exothermic, we can put it in the combustion chamber and incinerate it and then measure fluorine. Same thing with supercapacitors. Um, they have a very similar construction of lithium batteries. They have an internal uh, PVDF cathode. We incinerate it and measure it that way. It's a little bit, it's also quite a solid fluoropolymer, it shows up in ion chromatography, it's not a simple uh, layer. But otherwise, it's really all WDX wrap. If you're not doing WDX wrap, you're gonna miss a lot. Um, so this is what we're gonna talk about a lot today, and then go to each one of these pie pieces in detail, including the two pie pieces that didn't somehow warrant a, a legend. It just refused to put the ones just under 1% uh, with a legend. So this is the testing data of 2023. It's all very modern, there are hundreds of General data, hundreds of products, um, each product having 20 to 1,000 components in it, uh, very, it, and everything. It, there's everything in your electronics and, and, and medical devices and professional and laboratory and clothing, and there's everything in here. Um, now, this is basically approximate based on it. If we went into detail, I'm sure any of these numbers can move around by half their value, or probably a little bit less, but move around. So this is WDXRF. If we're using combustion ion chromatography, we'd miss all these ones. So what we're looking at and all the inter-laboratory and inter-method uh, combustion ion chromatography misses about 30% of the instances. So if it's tested in China, it misses about 30% of the instances. Just telling you. Um, combustion ion chromatography has a big time problem with surface coatings, uh, w, which is you know, extremely common. The release agents, the wire lubricants, the fluoro, fluoro-coated silicone, it just has lots of problems with it. Uh, fluoro-coated rubber, et cetera. It has troubles with the coatings. So, and if we do supplier data gathering, a lot of things like anti-drip go without. Now this is a bit of exaggeration, but not too much. This is what you get from supplier data gathering. You miss about half the instances. So if you're data gathering, uh, you're better hope they're not. And using that as your basis for compliance, you better hope that um, uh, nobody enforces. Especially if you're using it for PFOA, because it's wrong. And PFOA is a stop ship ban, just so you know. So um, we use at the first level for fluorine, we use wavelength dispersive. It's fantastic. We use combustion ion chromatography only for two very specific instances because it can't pick up surface coatings. There are two internal lithium batteries and lithium supercapacitors or ultracapacitors we need to do for the inside material. 
Now, that doesn't detect PFOA. If we detect a fluoropolymer, it can have PFOA under certain circumstances, which we're well versed in. Screening is our specialty, one of the reasons why you get tremendous information from us, but not at big cost. And, and people in the data gathering say, it takes you know, super cost, and here's how it takes to test. I'm like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> not at all. Uh, you got to be screening, though. You got to be smart about this. Um, but if you're smart about it, no, it's, it's cheaper than data gathering. Um, and if you say, hey, well, I have, these, I have these make this product, but I make huge variations of it. We still manage that. It's not that big of a deal. And we'll explain how to do that. So we use LC mass spec, mass spec 10, and mass spec for the PFOA family. It's similar, down to 25 parts per billion. Theoretically, we can test lower than that. But um, the false positives are a little high at that point, and sample prep starts to rear its ugly head. So we're going to call it 25 parts per billion, which is the regulated limit. Um, so again, as I mentioned, there's non-polymer PFAS and polymer. This is defined the low concentration non-polymer that's really not supposed to be there. And that's about 1% of the intentional uses. However, they often end up inside a polymer one. So they're actually, they're not purpose. So we use the LC for these guys, finding these. And this is very chemical specific. And some people say, hey, well, there's thousands of these. And I'm like, well, yeah, there is and there isn't. And we'll explain that. There's really about 20. Um, and I'll explain that. And that's probably a little hard for people to take in. And people are like, what are all the cast numbers for PFAS? I'm like, A, it's pointless, because a lot of them, when they hit water, all become the same thing, and most of them degrade into other things. So they're not what's being added. If you're looking what's being added in the product and cast number for a PFAS, it's not going to work out. It just, it's laughable. So don't. Um, you can use that from the obvious ones. I showed the previous one. There's about 50% of the time. It's not bad. But generally, no, it's awful. Um, I'll explain a lot of why. So when you look at PFAS, PFOA, PFOA is, we have, uh, Basically, in this year, with thousands and thousands of tests or whatever, we haven't seen PFOA as an additive yet. It's never added. Even the news reports say it's all added. No, it isn't. The C8 fluorosurfactants to make Teflon have been gone a long time ago. We just don't see it at all. Where we do see this degradation, it's either from a polymer, like the bottom left one, which is perfluoroalkaoxane. Basically, if you have a computer right now, it's probably in it. PFA is, when you have PTFE wire, it's actually normally PFA. Uh, PTFE is not very flexible. PFA wire is far more flexible, and it's actually chemically different. Um, it's got this ether bond. It's basically carbon, oxygen, carbon. As I mentioned earlier, what makes car uh, these PFASs normally forever chemicals is the carbon-fluorine bond. It's very high, very high energy of dissociation, which means it takes a lot of energy for it to dissociate, for it to break apart. That's why it's forever. Carbon, oxygen, carbon, not a strong bond. That's a weak bond. It's stuck, it's, it's scotch taped together. The other ones are basically like riveted on. Fluorine is riveted on the chlorine. The oxygens are scotch taped on the chlorine. So it breaks there. And the piece that breaks off is a fluoro chain. And depending on the length of that fluoro chain, you'll get certain lengths of the PFOA family. And that's where it comes from. Or you take PTFE, which doesn't have it at all, doesn't have PFOA at all, doesn't degrade into it. And then you hit it with gamma rays to make it rubbery. The gamma rays chop up the long chains, the long chains then reconnect and cross-link, and it becomes rubberized, which makes it a lot easier to process, like for PTFE tape uh, or um, EPTFE. Um, unfortunately, some of these links react with the air and become PFOA family, and so it's from a radiation of it. So in neither case is it added. It is literally a degradation product. The coatings on surface coatings on your jackets, the floral coatings are fluoroacrylates. They have that weak bond on the bottom left. That bond breaks, creates the PFOA families in different lengths. Um, it's also one of the reasons why if you have a fluoro spray jacket, every couple of years you have to respray it because the floral piece keeps breaking up, breaking off. So uh, that's where we see it all the time. If it's added, and PFOA isn't added, but there is a sulfonate added. So when we find a sulfonate, that's an additive. Basically, when something degrades into it, it's going to react with oxygen. And it's always going to be the oxygen-based one. And the sulfur pieces go away. So if it's sulfur-based, which is the PFOS family, it's there on purpose. If it's the PFOA, it, these are all degradation. They're not there on purpose. So uh, this is very complicated, people understand, but the top left is sort of a typical, I'm going to say Capstone. Capstone is a, is a, a name brand from Chemmores. Um, I'm going to use it because it's a lot easier way to explain this than saying it's a, a C6 uh, flotelomer. You, use, you take a Capstone surfactant. Um, this is what would be added to make something like Viton. A Viton's emulsion almost always right now uses a C6, six carbon fluorines, uh, fluorotelomer surfactant. It basically has a carbon fluorine section the flotelomer section, which I'll explain, which are carbon hydrogens. That's the two. Six of the carbon chlorines. Two is the carbon hydrogen. And then a whole bunch of stuff. And a whole bunch of stuff 
creates this polar thing, so it makes it a very powerful detergent. Carbon fluorine is very nonpolar, and the other thing it attached, the ethoxylated or amide ethoxylated, or like your lunch urge, by the way, is alcohol ethoxylate, not, not fluorinated, but it, it, same sort of idea. It creates a very, very, very effective detergent, surfactant, in low concentrations. Really good for emulsion, putting oils and, and waters together, like making Viton. However, the bonds are weak, and the big reactive section the left falls off, and you'll, you basically always end up with 6,2 flotelomer sulfonate. And that, then eventually the, the platelomer, the two carbon hydrogens pop off, and you end up with some level of a PFOA family. So we use Viton, what's added is the top left. However, what we get is the bottom right. And so it, it only matters if it's restricted, whether it's there or not, and what it degrades into. So instead of trying to, trying to measure every single obscure version of the top left chemical, you'll always, if it's used, or anything in its family, or anything even looks like it or smells like it, it's gonna end up being the bottom, you're gonna have concentrations of the bottom right one. So you just look for the bottom right one. It's not that complicated. It's actually true for azo colorants, it's not fluoros, but the same sort of thing is done for lots of testing, dactyl tins, organo tins. You look for the base piece. Because this piece, whatever the top left is, is always gonna fall apart to the bottom right. And now it's gonna fall apart a little bit more. Um, it's really simple. In almost everything that's used, when you add the salt versions or the surfactants, not the polymers, you're going to get a forever chemical part at the top, carbon fluorines. You're going to get a flotelomer. The flotelomer is the carbon hydrogen. The carbon hydrogen, it's always two, allows something else to be attached to the carbon fluorines because nothing attaches the carbon fluorines. So they have to create this two carbon hydrogen bonds then to attach anything else. The carbon hydrogens are long half-life. They last a while, but they're not forever. That's why we end up with six, two, six carbon fluorines, two carbon hydrogens, sulfonate, because that piece lasts a long time, but not forever. The forever part is eventually that platelum or the middle section goes away. And the short half-life, the very reactive portion goes away really quickly. So anytime, and the reactive portion could be anything you could imagine. That's why they have thousands of PFAS. That part goes away and you always end up with six, two FDS. And then you always end up a little bit of what happens when the two platelum parts fall off, which is much slower. Um, and then you end up with some level of six or a five or seven. There's a whole bunch of chemical reasons why that occurs. So in all cases, at the end of the day, you end up with a PFOA family. So we'll end up with six to FDS. And then we'll always, the very end of the day, we'll always have a little bit of, of the PFOA family. This is the six carbon hydrogens. Um, we often see seven, we see five. Um, there's a whole bunch of very complicated chemistry reasons why we see sizes five, six, and seven from this situation. Um, and that's your typical oxidation style. Complicated chemistry, but simplified. Whenever you have something super complicated, which can have a thousand variants on the left, we always end up with the 6.2 FDS in the previous page, and then a tiny bit of the PFOA family. They're all degradation products, so we don't have to worry about testing for every single obscure chemical. We're just have to, because the, no matter how obscure it is, it's always gonna end up with one of the other two. And since we're only looking whether it's there or not, and a lot of the legislations in this space are written for uh, things that degrade into these chemicals, it covers the whole family. So it's fantastically useful. Um, it's how you can handle zillion chemicals. And that's the fundamental. So we test, when we test the PFOA, the salts, this parts per billion stuff, we test for the fundamentals. So I haven't really got into the, the where of PFAS and articles yet, but I had to explain why we're doing it, where everything comes from. So for us, generally, the core fundamentals are the, the PFOA family. There's about 25 in that. And that's probably overkill because we do the short and long versions. We do some of the patelomers. And we also measure the fluoroacrylates because the fluoroacrylates help us tell where it's coming from. Fluoroacrylate coatings will have a one of their breakdown products is the fluoroacrylate, uh, which we can see quite clearly. And then we also look for the sulfonate. Now, sulfonates are almost always added. Or as you look in the previous pages, there are surfactant that degrades into the sulfonate and the sulfonate then degrades in the top one. Um, by looking at both of these, a lot of the, the we call them P25, so you do 25 of them. Easy way to keep track of them because the real name is extraordinary. It's like perfluoroalkyl carboxylates and uh, fluorotelomers, and there's just huge names. So we just call them P25. There's 25 of them in the carboxylate family, and 13 we look for in the sulfonates. Um, they're going to be restricted in the EU in 2027. Most of the long chain versions are restricted right now in the PFOA side, the top, the P25s, and the shorter versions in 2027. Um, yes, the PFOA family is banned right now. So you can't have it, and I bet you do. The chances are that almost everybody on this call has products that are banned in the EU right now for PFOA, or if your medical devices, you're banned in 2025. You'll have at least one. Because that stuff is, because it's, PFOA is almost always there from degradation, it's not an ingredient, it gets missed by the entire supply chain unless you're testing. But you still can't have it. 
And saying your supplier told it's not there, it doesn't count. They're so used to the, you know, the dog ate my homework type problem. My supplier said it was, it was good. They don't care. You got a volume of product you didn't test and you have it. If you don't have it, they don't care you got there. If you do have it, your supplier said it wasn't there is not a defense. Never has been. We've done lots of defenses, prosecutions. Never has worked yet. Not once. I have supplier data. It doesn't work. If, you, if you're caught, it doesn't help. You better have test data that you can back. So now under the real content. Now, this is how we get to this. Now, the, the, it's the WDX or RAF that gets this. So everything we talked on the previous page and is, is what can be in here. So when I'm going to talk about each one of these pie pieces, I'm going to talk whether they could have PFOA in them. So how we find these is WDX or RAF. How we find out if there's PFOA in there is, is a liquid chromatography tandem mass spec. Um, and there's more details around that. So this is a modern data. It's all 2023. So we're going to talk about this one. Second biggest pie is release agent. It's also completely uh, invisible to, to, to combustion ion chromatography and suppliers don't normally know they need it unless they look in the manufacturing floor and they go, hey, there it is. So it's an aerosol spray. By the way, I'm just gonna put a Dakin product on there. There's tons of people make it. You, you look on your, um, if you ever do environmental health and safety, you'll probably see it in your chemicals anywhere in your facility. It's the magic spray. It's either a dry PTFE or it's a fluorosilicone. Um, it's a spray. So imagine you have mold apart, like an O-ring. The O-ring, like muffins. So this is 15% of what we see are actually mold release agents. Where um, you have an O-ring, and you originally mold, mold ring doesn't start like as a solid nitrile rubber that you machine. No, it's literally goo that's put into a mold, and then you close the mold, and then it's fused. The problem is that goo, like your muffin in a muffin tin, would stick to the mold unless you put a mold release coating on it. So with muffins, you can put a cup underneath it, which you don't do for all rings, or you can put butter on it or PAM spray. This is the PAM spray of uh, the oil spray, but it's PTFE for mold release. So you spray the mold and therefore your O-rings come out. But then all of your O-rings have PTFE on the surface. And that's what it's from. So your O-rings, your gaskets, your foams all have it. I would say about a quarter of the instances have measurable over 50 PTFE. And it's not an ingredient, so your your suppliers won't know it's there, and combustion ion chromatography can't see it because it's a surface coat. But is it above 50 ppm? Yeah, definitely above. Um, it's a bit of a problem. But because of its concentration, you're not going to get any measurable PFOA family over 25 parts per billion. You could say, well, they could be in a can. The amount left over on the surface is not going to produce enough measurable. As a people of a test lab, you're not going to find any PFOA because there is stuff left over. We're talking hundreds of ppm. You're not going to start seeing, you know, 100 parts per billion PFOA concentration in something that's already only 100 parts per million. So, none expected. Doesn't mean it can't be there, but at the regulatory test limits and the regulatory limits and the testing limits, you won't see it, even if it was there. Um, so, it could be a PTFE dry spray, which won't have anything in it, or it could be a fluorosilicone spray, which can have a variety of things in it, but not at a measurable level. Um, so, this is very common O rings. You have O rings and gaskets, you've got PFAS just the reality of the situation. How many times? Maybe one in four, a lot. If you think about how many O-rings and gaskets and foams you have. Anti-drip agent, ridiculously common in electronics. So basically this has to do with the fact that a number of plastics like this one, uh, like ABS would burn, when they burn, they would drip. They're not allowed to drip and maintain a high flame retardancy rating. So flame retardancy rating is basically in the candle test, which is actually a Bunsen burner. You put it under the plastic, the plastic has to, um, uh, a self extinguish when you remove the flame away. That's one of the flame ratings. The other one is it can't drip. If it drips, it's a huge risk of both injury and moving fire to another zone. So, most plastics, the high UL94 rating, need it. So, like one on the left, you can see it's starting to drip there and come off. That has no PTFE drip. And the one on the right, you can see it bunches. So, when you add PTFE, about half a percent or so, it depends on the plastic, um, It when it burns, it creates a webbing. That webbing prevents the dripping. And so it kind of gets ugly looking, but it's, it's not a beauty contest, like what's on the right, but it doesn't drip. But if you don't have PTFE in it, the material drips. So it's extremely important for UL94 flame rating and the European equivalents. There isn't a replacement for it right now. It's a very specific property. Your housings will be full of it. Whether it's your outer plastic housing, your fan housing needs it. All of these high flame retarded plastic housings all have it all the time. They need it. Um, so it's 22% of, of the PFAS situations are this. It's 
pretty important. It's not replaceable. And if they said, hey, you had a replacement, and if there was a replacement, which there's not, requalifying the flame rating of all of your products would be something. Um, so this is very, very common. So every housing of yours probably has it, whether your suppliers have told you or not. It's pretty normal. Uh, right now, we banned in 2027, which would be a nightmare. One of the reasons why, many reasons why we have the PFAS, uh, derogate, the PFAS submission project to help justify why it's a really good reason to keep this. And the PTFE in its powder, it won't have any PFOA in it because of its construction type. It's perfectly safe. Um, it makes sense to keep it. So it also, because PTFE, unirradiated PTFE, which is different, it has no PFOA. In it. PFOA hasn't been used in additive that we've seen in modern days in PTFE. So you'll see no forever chemicals in it, even though it's half a percent of the plastic or so, you'll see no forever chemicals in it. So pretty safe. It's important for fire safety and there's nothing chemically wrong with it. Um, so of course, when we're doing justification of the PFAS submission project, we have to say, hey, no, this is why we need it. This is also why it's not a big deal. It's a perfectly good reason to keep it. Why are lubricants really common? So whether it's an interesting technical thing, whether the wires are sprayed on purpose with it or whether it's the equipment is sprayed and then go over the equipment, we find that fluorospray, the same mold release, same product, used totally differently on hookup wires all the time. Now they do improve the flexibility because they reduce the grip between the wires, which also reduces wear, makes the cable more flexible. We see it about on one quarter of wire bundles where all of the PTFE wires have been sprayed at a very low level with the spray. Now, whether they've been sprayed or the equipment that they go over has been sprayed, that's uh, a very good question, but we find them on hookup wires all the time. About one and a quarter of cable bundles, the hookup wires have a fluoro coating on them. Combustion ion chromatography can't see it. It's about 7% of the PFAS occurrences we see. So one in 14 or so. Um, we, don't expect, we don't expect to see any PFOA, and we don't. One of the reasons is mathematically, there's, the layer is not very thick. We're talking hundreds of parts per million of a fluorine and then any per, parts per billion PFOA won't be measurable. So even if it had it, which won't normally in a dry spay, probably not too often in fluorosilicone, it's not measurable anyway. So it's pretty low risk for PFOA. That's about 7% of PFAS occurrences. Now I'm going a bit fast just because of the time frame. Uh, so, and about 12% of the time we see a PTFE part. It's actually made a PTFE. Uh, and this is excluding wire insulation and tape. We, we regard them differently because they're actually quite a different application. This is usually a solid part requiring low friction or high temperature performance, low friction being the most common or high temperature performance. It's also incredibly acid resistant, base resistant, oil resistant. Um, so when, like, when we do the comparison of substitutes for derogation products, silicone is completely not oil resistant. All oils go right through it. it that's why you're, if you put your, your silicone spatula in the, uh, Dishwasher, it's gonna suck up every flavor in the dishwasher. It just doesn't stop oils. Um, now, pure PTFE as a powder, unirradiated, has no PFOA in it. There's no, and there's no oxygen bond in it to degrade into PFOA. It's as benign as benign gets. We don't see in solid PTFE, we don't see uh, PFOA at all or any of the forever chemicals. So very important applications, no chemical risk. PTFE wire, very similar. Now PTFE wire, some of the PTFE wires are probably not PTFE wires. We've upgraded our capability. Some of this is probably PFA, but a lot more PTFE. And, but a number of PTFE wires, really different chemical called perfluoroalkyl oxal. It's PFA, it's a different chemical. Um, PTFE, when it's wiring. So one of the problems with PTFE is PTFE is not particularly flexible. They're almost made of PTFE. It's like what's on your fry pan, pretty solid. Uh, PTFE is not wires, not particularly flexible actually. Uh, it's very low friction and it's very high temperature. So there's a really good use, reason to use PTFE in a dense electronics a wire because PVC can't take the temperature and it, it low, it's a lot of use for low friction. The downside is flexibility is not great. So complex electronics like a computer will, or a medical device that needs the flexibility will use PFA. PFA is a very different chemical. It seems the same and you might think it's PTFE wire, but it's not, it's PFA. It's actually chemically different. That's why it's got the flexibility. PTFE on their hand, Normal PTFE, unirradiated. So a radi like a PTFE heat shrink is irradiated and rubbery and flexible and totally different story. This PTFE is your normal powder, not irradiated, not expanded. Therefore, it never has PFOA because PTFE doesn't have PFOA added to it and it doesn't degrade into it. The only way you can degrade PTFE into it is you basically hit it with gamma radiation and it changes the physical properties and creates chunks that break off and react with the air and create PFOA. So unirradiated standard PTFE wire, we never see ever uh, the PFOA family. We test all the time. 
Lubricant spray, this is spraying on a plastic part, not just wires, or spraying on a metal part to give lubrication. I put a different spray. There are tons. I put the Super Lube one, great product. Uh, it's this dry film PTFE. By the way, every, all pictures in this are just representative. This is just examples. This is not necessarily what's on the product. However, we've done experimentation with the one in the bottom right. It's great for seeing things. Um, aerosol spray, they spray metal parts to reduce friction and wear PTFE, especially dry PTFE um, at the constant. Dry PTFE won't have PFOA anyways. I know, I know you've read all these news reports that you know, fry pans have PFOA, like no, they don't, PTFE does not. You have to irradiate. And, there, and it has to be turned in rubber. Rubberized PTFE does, PTFE doesn't. And fluorosilicone, the concentration on the surface won't have natural PFOA. But we see this all the time, sprayed on metal parts. It's not on the bomb most of the time. It's a lubricant spray, maybe in the bomb somewhere if you put the spray on there. Um, often the supplier is using it in their facility uh, for a lot of different reasons and doesn't appear in any of the data they give you. Um, it, but it's pretty, pretty common. We see the spray in 3%. So one in 33 PFAS situations, it's a lubricated plastic or metal part with an aerosol or a fluorosilicone spray, often the, the dry film aerosol. Floral elastomers are 5% of what we see. They're very, very, the Vitons, CalRes. So this category for us includes um, FKM, floral, which are basically, you know, brand name Viton, or puff floral elastomers, which are chemically different. That's FFKM. They're the more expensive, higher performance version. And then fluorosilicone, which often goes by the FVMQ. However, the M is methyl, and it's not always methyl. It can be a little bit different. Uh, the fluorescent rubbers have significant temperature and chemical resistance. There's a lot of reasons you can you have to use them over nitrile rubber or other uses. A very, very common high-performance O-ring or gasket material. Um, in our PFAS submissions uh, to the EU, there's a whole comparison of substitutes, and you can see it's kind of blatantly obvious why these materials are used in different situations. FFKM or CalRes does have a little bit of a problem because it does have an carbon oxygen carbon bond that breaks off a little into PFOA and virtually all floral elastomers and perfloral elastomers FFKM, FFKM are currently made with that surfactant family. So earlier, 6,2 uh, floral surfactant, which always degrades into 6,2 FTS. Whenever we measure Viton for, for chemicals, we always get 6,2 FTS. And quite occasionally the small numbers of the chemicals FTS breaks into, which is the four carbon long or seven carbon long uh, versions of the PFOA family, uh, which are not banned today because only long chain they're banned today, C8 and longer. Nothing, none of the bottom parts regulated today, but we have to ask for derogations. Anytime we use Viton, we also have to have them allow us to use 6,2 FTS and the small chain PFOA family that it degrades into. Always has it right now. It doesn't have to, there's other ways to make it, but they'll do right now. Um, so this is an additive. The bottom part is this, I mentioned before, it's like a, it's not necessarily the one on the top left, but it kind of looks like it. It's carb, six carbon fluorines, two carbon hydrogens, a sulfur, and then something else. And that something else always falls off and you get, you can always measure at least some 6,2 FTS. And that's how you know it was there. And anytime you see a sulfonate, you know it's an additive. Sulfonates are not uh, a degradation of normal polymers. It has to be something that reacts with oxygen. So when you radiate PFOA, you don't get any sulfur in it because the sulfur is not present. Um, and then again, as I mentioned before, the, anytime you add a surfactant, like this is used in the emulsion polymerization. By the way, you notice I'm going really quick because there's 61 slides. Um, you'll have references of all this afterwards. Um, and like, this is a lot of chemistry. I'm like, yeah, it is, but it's complicated. Also why, why a lot of regulators are having trouble with it. There's a carbon fluorine part. That's the forever part. There's a fluorotelomer part, which allows other things to attach. It's long life, but it will come off eventually. But 6,2 FDS still keeps it. There's a sulfur part, which stays around as long as the fluorotelomer stays around. But if this two carbon hydrogen goes away, the sulfur goes away. And then there's this reactive piece that almost always goes away relatively quickly. It's the non-forever part. And that's why whatever bottom piece is being used, that's you always end up with 6,2 FDS. So, and all Viton has it right now. Well, almost all Viton, basically all the ones we see have it. Um, you need to make an allowance for it. It is replaceable, but how easily is it a complicated question? So again, like usual, it degrades into the fundamentals and you will get a, a, at the very bottom of the chain, you're gonna get some of the small chain, like hex, which is six carbon uh, fluorines version of PFOA. So always has it, Python always has it. Uh, right now it's because they're using a, a capstone style, which is a name brand, like Python's a name brand, uh, surfactant to make the emulsion to make Python, the, which is a floral elastomer. Same with CalRes which is not necessarily that brand, but the, the perfluoro elastomer, which got an extra chain on it. And someday I can show you, in our submissions, we show you the chemical difference between fluoro elastomers and perfluoro elastomers. 
it's got a carbon oxygen carbon bond in flor in perfluoral, which gives a lot more chemical resistant, but it, it tends to have some PFOA family. Smaller versions fall off additionally. Uh, fluoro coated silicone. So it's not fluorosilicone, this is fluoro coated silicone, which is quite different. Fluorosilicone we see rarely, but we do see it when we put it under fluoral elastomers. Fluoro coated silicone is silicone rubber that's got a fluoro coating on it. Really common is about 4% of the measured occurrences. It's when we have a silicone rubber, normally, not exclusively, a silicone rubber piece that needs resistance to oil because it's a wearable or it's a keypad. Um, it's it, it needs resistant oil because again I mentioned earlier silicone is not resistant to oil whatsoever it picks up any stain or oil um, you lose all the writing on it because the oils would basically rub it off over time you put a floral coating on the surface um, again whatever floral coating you're using could possibly have PFOA family in it but the residual concentration is so low it's below any measurable levels um, so floral coated silicone is really common often keypads or anything you have to touch that's got oil wearable silicone is more mostly fluoro coated if you have a smart watch or something like that it's the silicone is probably fluoro coated otherwise so one of the reasons why also your silicone you know wristband eventually people get allergic reactions to it is because most allergens are oils so the silicone sucks it up over time and eventually get exposed to it um the really fancy ones are, are viton or fluoroelastomer they don't suck up any oil they're way better but they're pfas so they're, they're generally frowned upon, but they're far less reactive with you, which is probably a good idea, actually. Um, stickers. Expensive instances, you're like, are stickers? Yep, and it's really complicated, why? Two different reasons. So a number of stickers are fluorocoated on the surface for environmental resistance, water resistance. You want that you know, sticker to last a long time on that hard drive. By the way, not necessarily the hard drive, it's all representative. I just picked one. Hopefully there's not any name brands on it. It's randomly chosen there, but that sticker is often fluorocoated. Or it's on the backside, the adhesive has it, smaller concentration. And it's a little unclear where it's coming from. It, it looks like a number of cases coming from the release liner of the sticker. So when the sticker's peeled off the release liner, the release liner is fluorosilicone. That's what release liners normally are. And the fluoros come off on the adhesive. Low concentration, but about 50 ppm. Or in some cases, they can also use it as a surfactant in the adhesive. And so what happens is it reduces the surface tension of the adhesive, which allows it to pour into cracks better. And then, you know, better grip on whatever it's stuck to and better adhesion. Um, that's really for high-end adhesives too. Uh, it's a really good question, but, the, but most of them are on fluorosilicone liners and look to pick up the fluoro. We don't expect the stickers to normally have it, uh, but it's under review because there's so many different alternative reasons why it could be on the sticker. So the front, it's thousands of PPM. It's on the back, it's 100 PPM. Um, and why is there so diverse? We're still gathering testing data. We'll have a better idea whether PFOA family can be in them. Probably not, but it's so many different ways it could be there. Um, it's still under review. But that's about 6% of occurrences. So that's one in 16 uh, are stickers. Your stickers have them off all the time. On the outside, if you have a hard drive inside, they have them. Uh, it's pretty common. PTFE tape, the bugaboo, problem child, the reason why you probably can't sell your product in Europe. Uh, you just don't know it yet. Uh, PTFE tape, normally used to join two fluid components or two gas components together. Also common in medical devices, they wrap wires in them. Um, it's normally made by rubberizing the PTFE powder and then heating it up into a solid and then extruding it like Play-Doh. PTFE does not extrude like Play-Doh. You have to rubberize it. To rubberize it, you hit it with gamma radiation. So most PTFE tape looks like it's been gamma radiated, the original powder, to make it easy to extrude into a rope and then calendared busy pressed with rollers into the flat tape you have. That's the cheap way to make it. Most BTFA tape, but not all, by the way, have all of the PFOA family, all of them, the band level. You have PTFE tape two out of three times you're banned in your medical device, not until 2025. If you're a medical device with PTFE tape, chances are you have PFOA and the device is non-compliant July 2025. One of the many reasons we're doing this mission project is to deal with this problem. If you need PTFE tape in this situation, you're going to have PFOA and you really need a derogation or exemption for it. Um, no, not all. If you, there's a lot of different ways to make it. If you skive it with a blade, which got weird marks on it, it doesn't have it at all because it doesn't need to it. And you don't necessarily have to make it through radiation. There are more expensive ways to do it. But if you've got cheap PTFE tape or whichever, it's almost always irradiated because it makes it easy to, to extrude. Uh, and therefore, it's rubberized and it's got PFOA. All the time. You're like, we said PTFE doesn't have it. I'm like, this isn't normal PTFE. This is your perfectly normal PTFE powder that's then hit by radiation too small to make the powder smaller and also make it more rubberized. And that's why your PTFE tape is a bit rubberized, which is very different than like the surface of your fry pan does not feel like your PTFE pool tape. They're not the same material. Their cast number is the same, but they're not the same material. 
Um, fabric, we see fluoroacrylates in fabric all the time. Uh, everybody's like, oh, it's an outdoor clothing. Yes, it is. But it's also in virtually one in two of the um, tags. Oh, I'm about to reach it. There we go. Always oh, my favorite part of the whole presentation. That thing right there. That's not really floral. I know. What a weird picture. That's floral coated. The washing instructions or country of origin labor is almost always fluoroacrylate coated uh, for indelibility reasons or doesn't wash away. It's survived. It's um, it's usually fluoroacrylate. All fabric are basically fluoroacrylate coatings. Fluoroacrylates have one weak carbon oxygen bond. The carbon fluorine part pops off. And ever whenever we have a fluoroacrylate coated, whether it's in an outdoor cover, outdoor clothing, or that uh, washing instruction sticker, they have the entire PFOA family. I'd say it's not impossible that a large portion of all clothing in Europe is non-compliant right now because that sticker. They just don't know it and the uh, the supplier hasn't added PFOA to it. They added fluoroacrylate, which breaks down into PFOA. So it's an interesting problem. So we're looking at PFOA problems. It's very disproportionately that sticker. Now, of course, outdoor jackets, this is just one there, for example, um, has it normally, it, there's a good reason for it. Silicone, one of the replacements, is wrought awful of protecting its oils and stains. They just go right through it. Um, so this one, so fluoroacrylate's way more stain resistant, not just what water resistant. Floral coated rubber, we see more on the medical side. You take a nitrile rubber, you put a floral coating on it. It's about 3% of the occurrences. Very common in the medical industry. It creates low reduced friction and great acid resistance. Nitrile rubber doesn't have very good acid resistance. It gives it great acid resistance and significantly reduces the friction of nitrile rubber, which is really good for stoppers and plungers. Um, at that concentration level, we don't expect any PFOA. It's too low concentration. It's just not measurable. Even if they had PFOA residual in the coating, it's just not measurable at that level. PFA wire, ridiculously common. The other reason why your product is banned in Europe right now. Uh, PFA wire is a common insulation for wires. People think, hey, I'm using PTFE wire. No, nope, most of the time I'm using PFA. Uh, it's it's got a it's, it's PTFE with an extra bond in it. It's got a carbon oxygen carbon bond. That carbon oxygen bond breaks. You get the whole PFOA family. When we see PFO, PFA, half the time we see the entire PFOA family. And half the time we don't. And it's not quite clear why. Um, it could be because that bond can also be super short, it could be one carbon long which won't show up any PFOA family. Um, that's a very good question. So half the time we see PFA wires, we get every single member of the PFOA family, and half the time we don't. Uh, very common, dense electronics use it all the time, medical devices use it all the time, virtually all wiring for implantable devices uses PFA. Um, this stuff's all banned, medical devices, July, 2025, unless you get a new exemption, which is what we're working on. And if you're not part of our project, you're missing out. Um, very, very common. All dense electronics will have it. If you have wiring in your phone or your computer or other dense electronics, it'll be using PFA because it needs the flexibility and high temperature. Reflective coatings, 1%, pretty rare. Um, this is in anti-fog, right? It's anti-smudge coatings. It'd be anti-fog or anti-smudge coatings in glasses. Uh, it'll also be in the electronic displays. Most displays we, we uh, test have a floral coating on the surface, likely anti-smudge or anti-reflective or anti-fog. Uh, very thin floral coating at the concentration. We don't expect to measure any residual forever chemicals. So pretty safe stuff. Um, there's a whole bunch of others. We can't, they're not on the graph because they're not labeled properly. Again, so this is the test data. Um, moving on to Q&A in a moment. Uh, this is WDX RAF. That's where all the fluorines from. Where the PFOA is in there, that's uh, liquid chromatography tan and mass spec. Um, that's if using ion chromatography, you can't see all these things. So if you're testing in, in ion chromatography or in Asia, you're missing all these things. If you just bought an ion, a CIC to do this, a test lab, well, that didn't work out well, did it? Um, we have, we've submitted to, there's a big consultation project going on in Europe and what the test methods on. We submitted a lot of the uh, equipment and method uh, comparisons and we just can't trust ion chromatography. We can't miss 30% of the instances. We can't miss five, we can't miss one really. And it just doesn't fly. Um, and it goes data, we're seeing supplier data misses about half, if not more. I'm probably, um, you'll probably get anti-drip more often than it says here, it says you don't get it at all, but you probably measured some, uh, but generally won't. Um, we also didn't uh, talk about a couple of component types that are not, that either didn't have significant numbers make the pie chart or they're not testable for safety reasons. We commonly see floral binder in lithium batteries and we see them in super, super ultra capacitors, the capacitors where the, the capacitance rating is F, not micro app or pico app or nano app, but they're F. They use it because they're very similar to lithium batteries. Um, and uh, paper and paperboard food contacting materials. Like when we order in uh, taco bowls for lunch here, when we have an education session, we do lunch. Um, taco bowls of paper, they don't leak at all. There's a reason they don't leak. They have a fluoroacrylate coating in it, which degrades into PFOA. Um, it degrades so well, even a thin coating, we can see it, no problem. Uh, we don't test that many paper 
We the paper board we do test are generally for companies that have already gotten rid of it and just proving they got rid of it. So we don't see positives very often. When we pick stuff up in the open market, like we just got a lunch in, we test the stuff somebody brought home for lunch. Sure, we get it, but they don't appear in our stats. Again, we have this huge submission project. It's fantastic. Five submissions. The next on um, September, so September 6th is the next session. We're actually going over all the draft technical submissions and we'll circulate it. And there are five different submissions and PFAS and articles and comparison of substitutes and PFOA and articles and what's in drinking water and why it's getting there. And then all the different derogations are needed. Really strong. If you're worried about you know losing your uses because you have electronic product, you probably have at least 20 PFAS parts in your product, if not more. Um, it's kind of a big deal to prevent redesign, to see where it's at, where your risks are, and to actually be able to change it, to change the world. A lot of what's going to come out of this will change what you will be able to buy in the market. True thing. Um, if it allows certain things, it'll change the products you buy. Not the products you just make, but the products you buy. So big deal. Um, very strongly recommend. It's one cost per company. It's really straightforward. Strongly recommend. Again, okay, so I'm going to get into Q&A. I made it a little ahead of schedule, actually. Um, PFAS testing is fantastic. If you want to know what's in your product, PFAS, our PFAS testing is fantastic. It's accurate. It's comprehensive. You learn a lot. We also not only give you a test report, we actually give you this reportables sheet, which actually tells you what all the uses are in which parts. And if you had to report it, what it is, we also know from an exemption derogation, when the exemptions or derogations come out, you know all your uses. So this is just a test report to say, hey, you have it in these 20 parts. It'll actually give you another one. These are all the different uses, and this is which part in your product you use each use. It's phenomenal. Uh, strongly recommend. It, it's fantastic. Um, and also PFAS submission project, great. One cost for the company. Um, you think about the cost of redesigning your products, and if you could prevent just one extra product to be redesigned, it would pay for itself in a heartbeat. So definitely reach out. It's a fantastic project. The amount of documentation, you also get to benefit everybody else's knowledge and the fact we have a test lab. When in doubt, we don't really know for sure. We just go test it over there. And it makes life a lot easier. It also allows us to provide data at a level that none of the associations can provide. Now we say, hey, I'm working my association. Awesome. That's for your market segment, we're working on the applications and there's nothing wrong with having two horses in the race. I wouldn't want to put all my money on one horse, especially if you're in the association. They just don't have the technical detail or the technical expertise. Um, it's fantastic. So um, again, everybody who registered will receive a copy of the slides. Uh, we will have a recording available. Um, feel free to submit questions to the control panel. I'll try to get to as many as possible. It's a little bit over time for, for what I normally have, um, but there are a lot of content here and hope it's valuable. And I was going a bit fast, but you can understand from the amount of content, you can go back over it afterwards. There will be a recording. Um, so here are the questions. Uh, first question, of course, is to be recorded. Yes, I did push the button. I hope I pushed the button. Yeah, I pushed the button. So it's recorded. <laughs> so I always have a little bit of a moment today. I push the button. Uh, it's like, did I lock the front door? <laughs> um, Uh, I thought this webinar about your current situation from public opinion to ECHA's proposal. That's the next one. Um, this is, by the way, uh, one of the submissions. Uh, the next uh, major one on what we're submitting is September 6th. Everybody will see a press release on it. However, only people who are part of the project will be invited the one uh, to, to join the one next week. Um, this is the person public opinion. The public doesn't really know about a lot of things. What they know, and so the third submission is about what the public knows. What's in the news reports? what the science paper says and what they're actually finding and summarizing the very simple tables to try to simplify it and saying of all these news reports this is actually what each one says and they're all saying the same thing and the same thing is not what you think it is the funny thing is they always blame food contact material off the bat and whatever they report in blood or water has nothing to do with pants possibly something to do with the new paper straws they think you going the polyethylene straws or whatever polypropylene whatever was used before with plastic straws way safer than germs um yeah, it's kind of dumb. Um, um, where's the situation about derogating? So again, uh, there's a great question, but asking when's the situation about uh, the derogation? Next week, we'll have all the different ones. This is a public one, and we're talking about the uses. This is a decent basis of the first submission, which should be, here are all our uses. Just so you know, you've got to deal with all these things. Um, what amounts of PFAS materials have you seen in PFAS-free polymers like PVC? PVC doesn't normally have it inside. P the only time we see fluoropolymers in PVC is as a, a non-friction coating on hookup wires. 
We do see that relatively often. Again, one in four uh, PBC internal bundles, not the outer jacket, the inner ones. It's something to do with either spraying them to reduce friction, which works, or spraying the equipment they go to pick it up as they go along. I'm teaching uh, two manufacturers to produce PFOA heat shrink tubing to decrease numbers detected by analysis. Uh, it's possible. So uh, PFA, half the time we get PFA, we get all the PFOA family. Half the time we get none. And it's possible that so the PFA performance, it's a, it's a tough one, one with the carbon oxygen carbon in a side chain. That side chain is variable length. The short length ones don't produce the PFOA family because they're, they're too short um, and they're not regulated that way. So it's possible to make PFA without it. We've definitely seen it. Um, if it's irradiated, it'll always have a two. So again, any floral that's irradiated will end up with all the PFOA family because little bits that break up, some of them will react there. Where'd you get the 50% data missing supplier uh, statistics? Basically, we also get supplier data with um, some of our testing data. And it's a bit of a approximate because we can see what they're reporting, what they're not reporting. And then we look at what they're not reporting and they don't report mold release. They don't report the wire coatings. The, the anti-drip, they do report a little more than what I say here, but then they underreport some of the others. So it ends up being about half of them or more missed in, in the data part. Often when somebody says, hey, we did the data gathering the suppliers, we had these four PFAS parts, we're like, awesome, you have 50 when we do testing. Um, they miss a lot of them. Uh, restriction of EPA uh, could be well be all parts per billion, only in drinking water. Uh, sample prep doesn't work, I have to say bad words, very well <laughs> for small things. So in drinking water, a sample prep is pretty easy. It's water to put it in, um, really easy. But physical parts, we're still looking maybe 25 parts per billion is at most, and it's probably a little too strict, actually. Um, sample prep starts to rear its ugly head, even 25 parts per billion in small parts. So it's not the best limit. 50 parts per billion probably makes a lot more sense. Parts per trillion is only in drinking water. Um, and the funny thing is they, they go like, hey, this surfactant's in water points for trilling, we're all gonna die. I'm like, well, alcohol phosphate, which is also surfactant, not as powerful, which is your laundry detergent, is found in the same drinking water at hundreds of parts per million. That's a thousand times higher. It's, it's, that's actually worse. Um, so uh, how long would it take a testing form of normal product, say electronics in a plastic enclosure with a display? If we're just looking for fluoros, two weeks for anything really complicated, unless it's absolutely massive. If you want the PFOA side, it takes four weeks, but that's just for a handful of parts. Usually the PFOA risk is, you know, one or two parts in the entire car. But just the fluoro, it's two weeks. It's really good. Uh, WDX wrap is fantastic. It's fast. Uh, it's very detailed and accurate. It's not easy to set up the first time, but once you get it going, it's fantastic. Um, testing for, for fluoros is, you know, only so many minutes, but it's per part. Uh, rating labels are very important for traceability. Should we gravitate towards away from specific types of labels to eliminate PFOA? We're not 100% sure why they work this way. Um, we are putting a derogation saying, hey, the labels, we need it. They might say, hey, only ones for safety, fine. Um, but they're pretty important often when they're for indelibility, often they're safety labels, but it could be just, you know, the main label in the hard drive has it. Um, so it's an, we don't know where, how that's gonna go. So we're trying to phrase that in the submission properly, but it's a bit complicated. Oh, uh, WDX ref is 50 ppm. Subsequent testing is 25 parts per billion. Explain the scale. That's a really good point. So WDX ref is for ring content. It's not telling you which cast number. And the, and the funny thing is polymers only have about six or seven, really, uh, cast numbers. Like PTFE, it's one cast numbers. PTFE, irradiated PTFE, expanded PTFE, but they're very different chemically. One cast number. Um, we're looking for fluorine content. Anything intentionally added is, is there over 50 parts per million. The unintentional degradation products are parts per billion, we have to use liquid chromatography. But they're not there unless the intentionally added PFAS is there. So you can find the PFAS, use the fluorine, the intentionally added one, and then depending on the situation, um, some, we have a good screening method, the reason why won't, PFOA won't be there. And then we can test by liquid chromatography the parts per billion afterwards. So it's two different sets of equipment. Like in here, the left side one is 50 parts per million fluorine, which tells you the PFAS is there intentionally, and then inside the intentional ones, we can test by liquid chromatography. That's just an example of equipment in the middle there um, for a PFOA effect. It's really good. So a uh, question asks, how to join the submission project? It's a free field to reach out. It's fantastic. You submit your uses, even if you don't know all the uses, which by the way, our testing will help you tell you its uses, which is different. Um, we tell you, okay, this is derogation to follow. It's, we're gonna, we number them like this is C5 and C7. 
follow those ones. And then we provide um, all the draft information. And you can see all the, you don't get to see anybody else's individual information, it's all confidential, but you get to see the uh, amalgamated answer for everybody and comment on, you get to see what's happening. So you'll learn a lot, but you also get to show other people that, you know, what's being done to keep your use going. Um, it's fantastic. So perfect. Thanks everyone who, who um, joined today. Um, hundreds of people, which is pretty cool, I must say. Um, thanks much, Lily. Uh, the, everybody register, receive a copy of the slides, probably by tomorrow, hoping, and the recording should be available later this week. Next week for the participants in the PFAS submission project is the doozy one, where we're going over all the five different submissions and we'll be circulating them afterwards, because I need to explain them first, uh, the five different draft submissions for review. And they're of different sizes. They're almost always point form to get as much detail as possible, but they're still very massive. Um, we also try to use as much simple summary charts in front so the regulators can have a simple answer and not let their head swim. And then when they look, hey, have you proven this or justified it? We have a detailed answer now. It's really good. Uh, so thanks much, Lee. A pleasure hosting everyone again. And again, you need testing for PFAS. You're worried about PFAS in your product or you're worried about the current PFOA ban, which is a big deal. Um, you can get your stop shipped today. Uh, reach out. We'd be happy to help.